I've done this talk before to master gardeners at Ben Oregon in Multnomah County. And this is a lunch talk. So I'm going to give a very similar talk to you guys so that you and I get through, hopefully we'll know a lot more about roses than you did when we started. I'm gonna start out with a history and we're gonna go to selection and care. Hopefully I cover a lot of your questions before you have to answer them. That's what my goal is. So we're going to get started now with the history of roses. Okay. Okay, roses, believe it or not, are very old. They've been around for um, longer than 35 million years, but I went to that age because I can find fossils. Unfortunately, all the fossils, pictures were copyrighted, so I couldn't use them in the presentation. So anyway, they were found in, the fossils were found in um, ash flows. So, and the rose on your left, which is a local native, is the one they think they found 35 million years ago. And so, that rose is very old. It's one of our species roses. Now we have, we have across the Northern Hemisphere because roses didn't grow in the Southern Hemisphere, only the Northern Hemisphere. There are between 100 and 300 species roses. Um, all species roses have Latin names. They may have a common name, but they actually are tracked by their Latin names. Almost all species roses were in the Western Hemisphere, in North America, Europe, China, and the Mideast. In North America, there are 12 species roses that have been found and cataloged. Um, so that's basically where your plants came from. They do grow in, in the Southern Hemisphere now, but they didn't start there. Um, roses went into cultivation and being used in landscaping about 5,000 years ago in China. That's when we started getting some of our, what we call hybrids, when they started bringing in native roses from the wild and putting them into the landscape. Um, from China, we go to Greece. Greece loved roses. So for 3,000 years, they were doing and growing a hybrid between two wild roses. They grew abas and damask. The damask roses and them are both hybrids of native roses. They're very scented and they come in both um, shrub and climber. And the Greeks grew them for their rose petals and oils and used them on their, in their floor, on their floors, they used them in their baths, um, and they used the oil on their bodies. The same thing as we go into the Roman times, the Romans were even crazier about roses than the Greeks were. And so they did roses for everything. They went overboard. Um, they had rose petals dropped at big, at big entertainments, they had rose petals dumped by the bag into bathtubs. They made oils from them. I'm surprised they didn't have something where they were drinking them, but I couldn't find anything on that. Um, but they went overboard. They had, they grew roses in greenhouses. They were the first people that are propagated in roses in greenhouses. They grew roses in the fields. They also, because they needed them and they wanted them all year round, grew roses in the Middle East, in Egypt. And then they had the roses picked, the petals voted over to Rome. Um, so this went on for quite a while. But when, the, when the Romans were conquered, the rose went into decline. The, the uh, Catholic Church decided that it was a pagan plant and that the pagan plant should be out, should be outlawed. 
So it was several, two or three centuries before they decided that the rose should go with Mary and it came back into, into prominence again. Well, by then, a lot of the roses had been dug up, thrown out, discarded, whatever. And there was only a few left. They wanted the countryside to find roses. So to bring them back. So that's where they, they found them mostly in old castles, old monasteries, but they started bringing them back and putting them back into the gardens. So roses have had an interesting history around them. And as they started bringing them back this time, we start seeing more hybrids, more crosses between the natives, the native hybrids and the um, local crosses that were already crosses earlier on. Um, all these crosses were done by bees. There was no cultivation and hand pollinating of roses until the late 17th, 18th century. Next slide. I'm going to the species roses, which we've been discussing. Um, I'm going to give you the colors. Um, North America species roses only came in white in shades of pink. European roses were found in white shades of pink and red. China roses came in were white, all shades of pink, red and yellow. And the Mideast also had a full range of colors, including yellow. Now, if from the China area and the Mideast, those roses kind of filtered over as they were found. So um, you can see I put up two of my favorite species roses on the side. The one at the top, Rosa Glocka, is a rose that's got purple leaves on it. It is amazing when you see a mature plant of this in bloom. It is striking. The other one in the corner is Anglantine. It has apple scented rose leaves. So when you water it, your whole backyard smells like apples. Now, I argue with the book. The book says it smells like cooking apples. I grew Anglantine. Mine smelled like green apples. And my whole backyard and people walking their dogs down the side road. But look around for an apple tree in my yard and I don't have one. Another interesting one that I brought up is Rosa Indica. This rose is the parent of every red rose uh, you have today. And it was imported to Europe in 1792. Next, we go to old garden roses. And I divided these out a little differently than many books show them. I divided them out as one-time bloomers and repeat bloomers, because a lot of people look at old garden roses and think they only bloom once. No, there are several that bloom twice. Um, the Ava and Damask roses are the oldest, and then we go to the Galacticas. And um, the Galacticas from them came the center folias, which is the cabbage, which is what you refer to as the cabbage roses, center folia, and the moss roses. I put some pictures of some, again, some of my favorite roses on here. Um, this damask here is Mim Hardy. She gets about three feet tall, is covered with scented white blooms, and is really a beautiful little shrub. Blooms between six and eight weeks. This one is a crested moss, and it is amazing. The moss on these roses is scented along with the rose itself. The leaves on this one aren't as scented. I have damask moss, but my roses are also scented with damask oil. So even in the summer when the roses are in bloom, if I water them, I can smell roses. If I walk by them and brush them, I can smell damask rose scent. Uh, but all of these on the one-time bloomers bloom anywhere from six to eight weeks a year. And after that, they're done. And you just have a bush. And many of these are also at time disease prone, especially the mosses. Mosses and black spot go unfortunately go hand in hand. Uh, the bourbons, the hybrid perpetuals, and the Portlands, which are replete bloomers, 
are are much easier to grow, and many of them are very repeat growing. Um, I have um, uh, Reeves sea violets blooms about four times a year, and believe it or not, um, I shouldn't say Reeves sea violets. I keep pronouncing it wrong. Um, grows and blooms about four times a year. It grows on long arching canes, and I grow mine in partial a little bit of shade in the afternoon, and I have um, odd colored purple rose that you see on the screen. I had, it took me a long time to find that rose, that color. Um, that is what is known, what looks like a blue rose. In fact, it is one of the few roses that they classify as blue. Blue roses are purple. The rose coloring is identical for blue flowers in their genetics, but they show up purple. This one down here is a bourbon, and it is Louise Odier. I grow this one at home, again, another. It blooms about three times a year. All of these roses are extremely scented. Um, and these bushes, one gets about, the um, rainy violets gets about, um, seven to eight feet tall, but um, Louise Odier gets about three, three to Thanks. four feet. And it is, um, it, all of these have arching canes too, and the bourbons, I have not had one. It has been an up, upright, ex, I'll take that, there's an exception. Baron Prohost is an upright shrub. Most of them are arching. Um, next, we'll go into Modern day shrubs. Um, roses for modern day started back in 1867 with the finding of the first hybrid tree rose, which you see in the picture below. That is La France. And um, it, it is considered the very first hybrid tree. Now, I broke these out a little differently again so that we could understand them a little better. I could put it out as modern as hybrid teas. Floribundas are a combination of a hybrid tea and a polyantha. They were crossed, that's how they got the floribundas. The grandifloras are a cross between hybrid teas and floribundas. Then I went to shrub roses. Well, instead of just shrub roses, I I put them I put these all the rows similar to a shrub rose under shrub roses, English roses, hybrid musk, and polyanthus all grow in a shrub rose style. And then I did rugosas, and they're going to be a specialty rose. I'm going to talk about in a little bit, adding some more clarity to them. And hybrid rugosas, climbers. I put climbers and ramblers. Ramblers are the ones that you don't prune very often because they go up in trees. And you need, when you plant one, you need to put it on a big tree or it won't be able to support it. And in fact, they've been known to kill trees, they get so big. But other climbers are much more, <laughs> not as demanding. Landscape roses are a newer thing that's come out. They are totally disease free. So they, um, there a lot of people pick those. And most of them are unscented. I've heard that there's a few starting to come in scented, but I have, don't know the names of them. Then I have cold hardy roses. Buck and Canadian roses are all roses that will take very cold climate without dying. And there are some beautiful roses in that category now. Before it used to be pretty simple, they're beginning to develop some very gorgeous ones. Um, miniature roses, a lot of people probably don't grow them. I do, but um, some people find them to be, you know, a new, a little and they don't know what to do with them, so they don't grow them. And we have man made roses. Those are tree roses and weeping roses, which are a tree rose that is grafted. On one stalk, some are grafted just to grow as a bush, 
on top of the stock. The other ones are grafted, so they weep. Those are man-made. They're not roses that, that you'd find if you went to the store and just wanted to buy a rose. You have to buy a tree rose. You have to buy a weeping rose. They, again, take special care. I'll try to bring that up, too, when I get down into the care section. So that's pretty much does it for a little bit about the history of the rose. Now we're going to move into selecting a rose site. And I've taken multiple questions, both at Yard Garden and Patio Show, Information Desk at um, the Rose Shows, and up at the International Test Gardens. And I've had many people come in, Rose won't grow because it wasn't sighted right. So what I'm trying to do is give you some pointers so that when you plant your rose, It'll grow beautifully for you, and you'll be very happy and have lots of blooms to pick and bring in the house, which is basically what you want to do with most roses. Okay, first you're going to look at your site. First, where you're looking in your yard. Do you have trees? Do you have shrubs, buildings, and sidewalks? Those could be a problem when you're going to plant your shrub. You also have to look at the neighbor's trees. Does the neighbor have a tree that hangs over your your fence and parsley shade. We got to remember that tree is going to continue growing. So when you look at this, okay, this site is in sun, but when you plant your rose in five years, is that site going to be in sun? Because when you plant a rose, it's a long-term shrub. And, you know, you leave them there for years. I do anyway. I'm hoping everybody else does. And then you have to look at how much room you actually have for this shrub. I mean, I have a shrub at home right now that I planted on the side of my house that now that it's mature at 25 years, it's 12 feet by 12 feet. And it grows that much every year. So you got to look at your site. Um, but in my case, in this one, I bought it as an orphan from heirloom and I didn't know the name of the rose. So I just put up with it by pruning it to keep it in space um, because it's, it's, a, well, it's a continual bloomer. It blooms year around. I just had a big bouquet of it in my mom's living room in January off that rose. So it likes where it's at. Then the next thing, and this is very important, how much sun does it get? But the, even if you say a rose can grow in shade, it still needs at least six hours of sun, period. Roses do not do well in shade. They don't bloom, they're more disease prone, and they get leggy. You get lots of stem, but nothing else. And another one that you need to think about is soil pH. Roses are a neutral soil pH. They like six to six and a half. And that's it. Anything lower, if you plant them in four, like you would plant an azalea or rhodi, your rose will die. It does not like that low pH. That's why in, in the Northwest, we lime every fall. That's to keep the pH stable for the roses. The next one is soil drainage, another extremely important one. Roses also will not tolerate wet feet. They will die. So and the next one over, I've got a soil perk test to show you how to check for that. Um, on the pH, my suggestion is just go down to one of the Home Depot, Lowe's, Gardening Center, and buy one of the little kits that does pH. It's I, don't, I haven't looked at the price on them for a while, but it's not that expensive. Go around where you're going to plant your rows or several roses, collect it, mix it all up, and then test it. If your pH is too low, you're going to add lime. Or if it's really low, you're going to have to find another place to plant your roses. Or you're going to put them in raised beds or containers. Now, the other, next thing is how much time you have for the care of a rose. Roses can be 
like ground cover roses that need almost zero care. You can take a hose out, water them, knock all the petals off. You don't have to deadhead them hardly at all. But your hybrid teas, your floribundus, your grandiflora, some of your OGR, they prefer to be deadheaded. One time bloomers, I kind of leave, you go to hips. But the rest of them, my repeat bloomers, all have to be deadheaded. Uh, you're gonna take it's gonna take time to do that. Also, spraying. Some roses are more disease prone than others. Um, I do a lot of selection. I have a, I have access to books that, from the Rose Society that gives me hardiness on the roses. So are they hardy or not? Well, as we go into the next slide, we'll have you doing some research. But you've got to figure out roses do take time. Not only pruning time, they need to be deadheaded. They need to be watered. Um, and then at times they need to be sprayed because you can't deal. Most of the time with aphids, you can spray them off and they'll go, go away. But once in a while, you'll get something that doesn't go away and you're going to have to spray for it. That's going to take time. So think about how much time you want to use. Now, I just filled this picture in with a rose that I've seen multiple times at rose shows. I love this rose. It's scented. It has dark green leaves that make that white rose pop. And that white, that rose is pure white. It will eventually be an addition to my garden. And it is fairly disease-free. Next slide. Here is our soil drainage perk test, you're gonna dig a hole, just like the size of the hole that you want. I want it, to, I dig mine, and I every rose I plant in the ground, I dig a hole, I do the drainage test before I ever put it in. I dig it 18 inches by 18 inches, and then I fill it with water and let it sit. Most of the time I'm lucky in, in it, it drains fairly quickly, but sometimes if it doesn't drain well and you wait, wait, wait. Okay, so the next morning you get up, oh, my hole's empty, we gotta fill it again. And then you wait again. What you want is a hole that you're planting your rose in that will drain in less than six hours. They may tell you 12, 18. No, you've gotta realize we get a lot of rain here, but when we have, heavy rains, those roses, base of the roots are going to be sitting in water because it's not going to be draining the water out as fast as it would if we were in a drier climate. So I usually say, if it drains under six hours, it won't, it, you can plant a rose, you're good. Next, we have rose bush sizes, and they come in every size. Uh, we have miniatures. Now, the miniatures are really elusive. They can be 12 inches tall, and they can be four feet tall. But they're miniature roses. They have miniature little blooms on them. Um, next comes ground cover roses. You've seen a lot of those, the knockout series. I think there's a couple other series is coming out. They're all um nice roses most of them are on their own roots um you plant them they're disease free they bloom and take very low care they make great landscape edgings things like that but if you want to pick them they're not really a picking rose they don't hold up well in a vase they kind of wilt real quick then we go with the floor abundance they go anywhere from three feet to five feet. And the width on them is about three feet to four feet, depending on the bush and the name of the bush. They grow a little differently. They have candle, what we refer to as a candelabra. Their roses are come up in clumps, usually of five to 10 roses on each stem. So floribundas have a hybrid tea-like bloom. They're smaller and they come up on candelabras. You will very ha seldom have an individual bloom on a floribunda. 
hybrid keys. Now those are the ones, they can be anywhere from three feet to 10 feet. I have Lynn Anderson in my yard, it gets 10 feet tall. And you, I guess I have used the ladder to, to pick this rose because the beautiful blooms were 10 feet in the air. Um, but, so your hybrid teas you wanna look at. Look at, read up on them when you buy them. Um, we'll get into that in a few minutes. But they can be anywhere from three feet to 10 feet, but the norm is about three feet to six feet, some seven feet. Shrub roses, they can be anywhere from three feet to 15 feet wide. And that's height and width. So again, when you're buying a shrub, you need to look at the size of it. Um, my shrub roses are all small, but I did my homework before I bought them so that they would stay smaller. Climbers. Climbers can be a trick because a lot of people want to grow a climber on a trellis. Um, most trellises aren't big enough to handle a climber. They're, they're designed to handle clematis and other vines. But roses are bigger and they're heavier. So you need to think more fences. You need to think more decks where you can run them along the deck and su support the weight of the rose. And they bloom better when they're not growing like this, like is shown on the screen. Ramblers are big. Big roses don't need much care, but they need a very heavy support because you don't prune these much and ramblers bloom. One of the few roses that blooms on second year wood. Standard roses, rose trees. These are grafted. At the very top of that cane is grafted root shoots, which grow your plant. These roses do need more care. The weeping roses are the same thing. They grow arching canes, but they are grafted to grow that way. They also need special care. If you will see in that picture, they're both supported. They also need to be wrapped in winter to keep them from freezing. So next slide. Okay, selecting your rows. Types of rose bushes for sale. Do you have bare roots? The bare root can be grafted or on their own roses. And you have grades in bare roots. And the grades go from B to A, A plus, A minus. So you have different grades when it comes to both bare root and potted roses. And again, both, both of them can be found grafted or on their own roots. Um, I got a package here. I wanted to use this as an, another one more coming up, but this is a rose I bought. It is, um, it shows here that it's an, a, an, a one and a half. Okay, they, they, can, they can come in A and B grade and they can come in one and twos. One plus is the top of the line. One next line down. 1A, well, that's a smaller road, but it is, is the roots on the bush and the health of the bush and how long it's been in ground. Most A's and 1A's have been in ground a little longer than the, this, the rose on the screen here. But I wanted to show you that these roses are available. They do well, um, but you have to baby them a little more and pay attention to what grades you're buying. Because when you buy these grades, they normally do not go up after you grow them for a while, even fertilizing them. It's because this particular rose is grafted and the grafted rooted rose will not, probably not handle a bigger bush. Eventually what I will do is take this bush and cut it and um, make cuttings of it and put it on its own roots. So it will get bigger. Um, and when you're looking at these, you'll see a picture here 
and on the air plant, on a potted plant, you will see a picture on the plant. And, and on the potted plants, they may or may not be in blue. So you're going to look. All right. Now, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to get your phone out. And you're going to look this rose up. You're going to read a description of the rose. That description should tell you whether how big it is, how it grows, disease resistant, what color the rose is, a little bit about the rose in general. It'll also give you the height and width. This rose is at maturity. And, and is the plant upright or does it have oxygen tanks? Well, that on the phone, if it shows you a mature picture of the plant, it will show you whether this is an upright plant or an arching cream, but especially when you're looking at shrub roses and English roses. Some English are straight up and some English are very arching canes and will, no matter what you do, they're gonna arch. And what zones they grow best in. Unfortunately, some of the, the people up here that get their roses in, they're, they're bought like Lowe's and Home Depot and some of our other big stores, they're bought in huge amounts when they go to a goal. I want 10,000 plants. Well, some of those plants get shipped to the wrong stores. So you've got to look to make sure that the rose you're buying grows in this area well, or you will struggle with it. And I will be taking lots of calls from you why my rose isn't because it may not grow here. And that's a problem, especially when you get some of them from the South. Uh, so um, then we'll get into that on down the road on care. Um, you want to check for disease information. Some of the newer roses that are coming on the market now are less prone to disease. They're starting to breed disease resistance back into hybrids and through abundance because people got, got irritated because they had to spray all the time. Is it fragrant? Well, hybrid teas, they grew for flower for years, I took the scent out. The new hybrid teas, many of them are now scented and they're also less disease prone. Then you want to look to see if there's a label on that plant saying whether it's on its own roots or it's crafted because they will grow just a little differently. The grafted rose can, can down the road cause problems by deciding to send up the grafted root. And it will, it will take, take energy from the plant you want growing. Okay, here we go. Planting your rose, bare root rose. Now this one you see in the picture here, after you unwrap it, is a mail order bare root rose. I have a rose here that I'll show you in a minute. That is one that I showed earlier. I opened it up because I wanted you to see the roots on it. This rose is got a lot of nice roots on it. It's got a lot of top on it. It was shipped, and that's bare root from from. You get them from JP. I used to get them from Edmonds. Uh, heirloom always comes uh, potted for local for weeks. It ships both ways. David Austin ships both potted and bare root. But any of those that ship, you'll get a root system like that wrapped in plastic. In could be bark dust. Um, what I'm going to show you here earlier was in a mix of compost and bark dust. Uh, you're going to dig. You're, you're going to go back out and look at your 18 by 18 inch hole. And make sure it's dug deep enough. Now that you know that the water drains out of it, so yeah, you're going to put this the top rows on a mound. And you're going to take those long roots and feed them out. Those roots are anchor roots. They're not the roots that feed the rows. I'm going to show you this one so that you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Can they see this? Okay, these are anchor roots, these down here. 
These little tiny fine roots up here are the feeder roots for this row. This rose will roll these roots down, anchor that bush so it will stay up in the wind, the rain, the snow, the ice. Now, and it's also hollow. So when I put this on a mound, its roots are gonna slide right down over that mound and spread out. Now, these roots up here will grow out and they will grow out to at least 10 inches to 12 inches, depending on the size of the road from this rose. So that's something you need to know. And if you will notice this rose, the rose on the, on the screen, in the picture has long roots, that was bought and shipped their root. This is a package rose I bought. The grafted roots, or the grafted roots, the um, roots have been cut. So the anchor roots are all cut on this rose. And most of the feeder roots are gone now. When I get home, I'll put this in a bucket of water. I'll plant it tomorrow in a container. Now, the other thing about this rose, this rose is grafted. There's one stoot here. I don't know if you can see it in the screen, the grafting on this rose where it was grafted. So that this, this plant here is a different rose than this plant and this plant here. So I bought that to just give you an idea of what when you buy one at the store in a bag, what it looks like. Um, you place amended soil around your rows because your feeder roots you want to promote growth on those. They will grow better in amended soil around them. Um, potted roses, you're gonna put them in your 18 inch hole, but you're gonna fill the bottom of the hole until the top of that rose is right at the level of the soil top. And then you're gonna fill it in with amended soil around that root ball. You're gonna pack both of these in. Some people use their hands and press down real hard on them. Other people use their feet to get that soil packed down around that rose. Then you're gonna water them in. Okay, if it's still cold like this morning, when we had snow, you're gonna put, you can put compost, you can put bark dust around, you can see in the one picture, around the top of that rose. I've been known to cover those roses completely up, especially if we had one of those late snow and ice storms. I would go out and all of my newer roses that I just planted, I'd cover the whole crown up of that rose. Um, and you do that for both, both potted and um, bare rooted. The other thing is once you get them in the ground, remember when you're watering, do not water this rose at the base of the plant. The roots aren't there. The roots are out in a 10 to 12 inch section around the top. And the feeder roots are at the top of your soil. The anchor roots are deep down in your soil. The feeder roots are what need the water. That's what keeps the rose. The anchor roots anchor the rose bush, keep it up and store food for the rose. But it's the feeder roots that take care of the rose. Fertilizing the same way around the edges. Don't just put it at the base of the rose. It's got to be spread out for that rose. Um, and then you Okay, rose diseases. I, I picked my four favorites. We have black spot. Wow. Um, every leaf on your roses this year, you go to prune them. When we did that, every leaf has to be removed. We've had a lot of rain. Even though the leaf looks happy, it's got black spot spores on it. Remove it. And that way you will and clean up all around your plants. Everything this spring, when you prune, clean up all the dirt, remove all the dead leaves. That's step one in taking care of all of your diseases. It also helps remove eggs that have been laid on your roses. And yes, you get eggs laid on your roses. Um, powdery mildew. Now this one is fun. This one, I only have problems with this one in late summer, early fall. Um, up here, 
Um, I haven't had much problems with it, but I've been working on other things with it and treating my roses, so I didn't get any issue. A uh, rust, which is the next one down, um, is one another one that I only get in the, in the late summer, early fall. Um, and only certain roses are prone to it. Queen Elizabeth, forget it. We call her the rust queen. She is very, very prone to rust. And not so much fault. And she does a beautiful job blooming in the spring and giving you amazing cut roses. The next one is Botrytis blight. Now, this is a fungal infection, just like rust and black spot. This one comes from too much rain. Um, you get it in the spring, especially on big rosebuds. This is why when you laugh and you hear people with umbrellas at the Rose Society, they put umbrellas on there to protect those big rose shell blooms and to keep the rain off them so they can keep the tritus off the bloom. Um, and many times in the winter, if I haven't cut my roses back, I'll have some. My one on the side of the house right now has a lot of botrytis in it. Uh, I'm going to be down in the next week or so cutting it completely back. So all that will go. Um, the other one, so botrytis is one you'll see. You'll see it in the fall when the rains start. You'll see it in the spring. It is a weather-related issue. There's not much you can do to spray for it um, because it's just there. The other one I have is rose mosaic virus. Unfortunately, when you get this, the rose will eventually die. Um, you have to be very careful pruning this rose. It will last for several years with this virus. But every time you prune it, you have to either use a 10 to 1 bleach on your roses or alcohol on your not on the rose, on your clippers, because you can move this virus to your other roses. So in my case, when I get it, I dig it up. I don't want it in my other roses. And luckily for me, I've only had one plant of it. So there are a few more things in rose diseases, but what I'm showing you are the most common. Next, bugs. Insects that like roses. Of course, the first one on the list is aphids. They're year round. I had aphids here a while back on nearby roses. They had to go out and dig, dig up the holes, put it back on, and wash them off in the middle of winter. I wasn't real happy about that, but that's what happened. Uh, but you get those, uh, especially on your butts. When you're planting, if you over fertilize with nitrogen, aphids love those new shoots that are growing really rapidly. Uh, so uh, my first defense on aphids is water. Spray the aphids off. Mash them if you can't spray them all off. My next is safer. Uh, I try to do most of my roses organically. And not, all, not always do I win, but I try. Um, the third one, is, the second one is spider mites. Spider mites come on in the summer when it's hot and they can take over a plant pretty quickly. Again, I use water to wash them off and I use, and sometimes I use it uh, safer and I spray the underside of the leaf. I literally turn the nozzle uh, around so it sprays up and I spray under the leaves. Thrips are a little harder on the third one to get rid of. They are in the flower. You can see them in white flowers. Most, most roses have them. It's when they get too, too bad that it causes the blooms like you see down below, or see in the third picture. Um, they, they damage your rose blooms and virtually you have to cut them off. If they get really that bad, I use a systemic because uh, sprays don't work real well on a tight bud. You have to go through the plant to get to them. 
sawflies. Oh, this is a new one for me. I've only had them once in my garden in Portland. But up here, they took out half of my roses on my deck in four days. I had, I, what they do is when they come in and you know you've caught them, if you look out in your bush and all of a sudden you have a skeleton leaf. You have partial leaf and the rest of it's open and you just have a little outline of your leaf left. That's sawfly larva. They eat the back of your leaf off and leave the top there and then the wind blows the top out and you end up with skeleton leaves. They can be aggressive, but they're short-lived. Now I went through all of mine and took all the, all the larvae I could find, picked them and removed them. But then I had to use, because my roses weren't in bloom, I used a system to make sure that they didn't come back because they practically de-leafed all of my roses. And that's really hard on your roses in August when they're starting to take nutrients and put in those anchor roots and, and the stems for next year's growth. So I had to do something. But my roses at the time were not blooming. I do not use any kind of insecticide at the time of bloom, period. A third one or the fifth one is one most people don't think about, but we get tons of questions on it, is raspberry cane bloom. They not only, not only like roses, or raspberries, they like roses too. And, and they, will, they will devastate. You've pruned your roses, you've let them go. Okay, everything looks good. You come out, why is that cane not growing? You look at the center of the cane, there's a hole in it. Or you have a cane die in the middle of, of your bush. and you're, Why is that cane dying when the rest of the rose looks good? Blame it on cane borers. In most cases, it's the raspberry cane borer. It's laid eggs. The eggs have hatched, run into the center of that bush, and eaten all the pulp out of it, and eaten the edge of it, and the upper part of that rose can no longer be fed. It dies. So you have to go in and cut it down off below where the cane borer is. Sometimes it's put under the ground. Other times it's just down to where you actually have live leaves. Um, so yeah, those are the main insects I deal with growing roses. Some of the other ones I don't have much problems with, but I can answer questions on them. Okay, pruning guidelines. I know there's a lot of people that are very interested in this. I'm going to start with how to start your rose bush, how to look at it. So many people stand there and look at a six foot tall rose bush and go, how am I going to prune this rose? You're going to start by cutting it down some. You're going to take it down to three feet. Okay, now you can actually look at the rose, look at the canes, and see which canes need to come out or which canes you can leave. Now, I had somebody say that they had 40 year old roses. We're going to get into some, when I get to the pruning, I'm going to tell you some new ways we've been pruning older roses at the Portland Rose Society that we've been working on, especially since roses have gone up to anywhere between 42 and $50 a rose for number ones. So I'm going to tell you that, first of all, address this bush by just cutting it back to three feet. Don't worry how you cut it. These are not permanent cuttings. That's, this is just taking the bush down so you can work with it. Next, you're gonna look at all the, if there's any dead canes. If there are dead canes, you are going to cut them off to the base of the plant. Prune back dying branches back to live cane. If we've had a really cold winter, as you start taking that cane down, most roses go down to 18 inches. If you start taking that cane back, all of a sudden you have brown pulp. That cane is dead. It might be growing. It doesn't know it's dead, but it's dead. It won't. The minute the heat comes on, all of the shoots on that rose will wilt. You're going to take it back to a white pulp in the cane center. If you don't find any all the way down to the ground, Cut that cane completely off, it's dead. The next thing after taking out the dead canes and that 
You don't look at the cross canes, especially even if it's an older cane, if it's rubbing, two canes are rubbing, select the most prominent cane to the outside and take off that cross cane because it's destroying and breaking the bark on the rose stem. And it lets infection into your rose. So you want to take that cross rubbing cane off. Prune out weak canes. Everybody looks at these canes, well, it looks good. If you have a big fiber teeth that produces stems that are as wide as your finger, all of those weak small canes will not hold up a bloom. Take them out. Don't leave them. They will not. They'll bloom, they'll leaf out, but your bloom will be little tiny and they'll be little. They won't, they won't look like what you're looking for. And then you can see here the correct way to prune. And the, the incorrect ways to prune, you want to do and be as careful as possible when you do that last 18 inch cut. That's when you are very careful. When you prune out your crosses, some of those go down to the ground, you just cut them off at the base of the rose. But if you're, if you're cutting out wheat cane and you're cutting it down to a bush, you're gonna cut right at the edge of the, the cane. Thank you. And that will eliminate cutting it across wise. But when you cut down to 18 inches, you're gonna do that third one over. And that's one you have to be real careful with. Um, so anyway, next I wanna give you some information on how to prune different things. And we get a lot of this, especially at Rose Society, um, how to take care of these things. And we get a lot of them of people who buy houses and have roses that have not been taken care of for years. So we are going to start with landscape roses. They are the most common. They're running along your sidewalks. So you can put them in. Oh, I take care of those. Those are hard pruned. Cut them down to six inches. Um, be sure you cut them correctly, but down to six inches. They'll grow back. Um, this is now this was taught to me. I don't grow landscape roses. Uh, I don't have many climbers either. But I got this from Harry Landers, who was the past curator for the International Test Garden. He told me six inches, cut them back hard. They will grow back. And that's how he cuts them up at the test gardens. Okay, hybrid teas, floribundas, grandiflores, and shrubs. I prune them all the same way. It's what they call this picture here from the Royal Society calls it moderate pruning. I prune them back not to 12 inches, but to 18 inches. I clean them out. Now, here's where you're going to get some differentiation. One to 10 year roses. If they're 10, one year roses that have been in the ground, I like prune. Two year roses, they get their first main pruning. If I've had them for two years, they're going to go back to 18 inches. Now, three and four, five-year-old, you're going to cut them back, but you're also going to cut back the old, cut out the oldest canes in those shrubs. Those old canes are darker. They have a heavier bark on them. On newer ground, um, that's on floor bunions, hybrid trees, ground forest, and shrubs. You're going to take out that old cane. It's going to send up new shoots because you've taken out that old cane. But once your rose gets over 10 years old in ground, whether it's grafted or on its own roots, I leave old cane in there. And I only pull in those rose bushes to two feet. You would be amazed at how much quicker they came back and how much fuller they have gotten by changing that pruning technique. This is something new that's just come out of the Portland Rose Society a couple of years ago. When roses started getting so expensive, we started looking at different ways to prune them. I've been doing it 
uh, for two years now. And my roses have responded beautifully. Climbers. Now we get to an interesting stage. Most climbers are large. Most climbers go on large trellises, not the small ones you see in the store. You will, your rose within two years will outgrow that. Climbers can be aggressive growers or they can be slow growers. And, they, and I've had, I bought a England thyme that was supposed to grow a climber that was supposed to be a slow, small rose, small climber. It grew 10 feet on every shoot. And the shoots on shoots grow 10 feet. I was pruning that rose to keep it in the area I planted it four times a year. I eventually killed it because I pruned it too long. So climbers, you want to espalier them, just like you would do an espalier fruit tree. You're going to take the heavier cane, you're going to tie them to wires or to your fence. However you want, you can put screws in your fence or hooks in your fence and tie the rose to them. Then, the first year, you're going to go in and look at that rose. You're going to take those heavy canes that are there, and you're going to prune off, as you can see in the picture, uh, all of the side shoots. Thank you. The side shoots, you're going to take those off. There we go. Yeah. You're going to take off all your side shoots, anything like that. All you're going to leave on that cane when you get done is long, bare canes. They will shoot and they will bloom off those side canes and they will bloom very heavily. And so if you grow them up and not espalier them, they will not bloom as much. And that's how I treat climbers. I have one getting ready to go on the ground. As soon as my hardscape is done, I will be espaliering it. It's continual blooming and it will be very happy once I get it done. And I will be able to pick scented roses off it all summer. So, that's the basics on rose pruning. Now, I'm going to get into some unusual ones. Um, and now I'm going to, I've got removing a sucker's and four shoots. This is one we get a lot of. Now, your basic graft rose in the Pacific Northwest is called Dr. Huey. It's a one time bloomer, it blooms red. It can be beautiful when it's rose, when it's fertilized and all of that, but it's sapping your rose bush. It is taking uh, energy out of the roots and taking energy out of your plant. Now, I have a picture here of my, from my own garden. And you see that long green cane here? That I think is a sport. Because as you can see, this bush is three years old. This will be its first pruning. It's from heirloom. And this cane came up last fall. It's very aggressive. It's already got shoots on it that are two inches long, whereas the rest of it is just starting to shoot. I went in, dug down in the pot, as you can see over here, and I cut it off right at the base. Now this rose has bloomed. This shoot bloomed last September. It's a pink, it's scented. I cut that off and put it in the bucket to do cuttings off of. So that the same thing I did with this, with the um, this uh, short shoot you do with your canes from grafted. Now the grafted roses can come up, um, Dr. Huey, or they can come up another rose that never blooms. But you'll get a come up. They'll grow faster than your normal roses. Cut them out. Dig down to the ground, dig under the ground, and cut them right where they're started on the root. That way, hopefully, they won't come back, but you'll get another one later on. But what you're trying to do is remove them so they will, so all of the energy goes into the rows you want to grow. Now, what I said I was going to come back to rugosas. Rugosas are a unique rose. They are most almost, if I grew rugosa, I would only grow it on the grafted rose. Most of my roses I grow bare root because I find them to use less water 
and grafted roses. And with Portland's water bills being astronomical, um, I try to limit my water. Um, but rugosis have a tendency to spread. Most on root roses spread a little bit. Rugosas are notorious for it. You can plant a rugosa for the first three years, it's a nice little shrub. Then it starts doing runners and it spreads. And before long, you have a massive rose that you may have not wanted planted where it's now growing. So my suggestion is if you get on root rugosas, plant them out away where they have plenty of room to grow. Now, rugosas are disease free. You do not spray rugosas at all. It will literally remove every rose leaf on the plant. And I had that happen. I bought a rugosa to give to a friend from heirloom. And I was spraying mine with just an organic spray. Um, I was out spraying all of my roses for um, late summer powdery mildew and rust. And the wind got a little gust of wind and it didn't get much on that rose because I had said it was in a pond. I had set it away. It was enough to delete the whole rose. And that was just a minor amount. So rugosis, no spraying anywhere around them. So basically that gives you your idea I've given you some information here on references, some of the books I've used. Um, the websites are all listed on the presentation. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things when you spray. Heaven forbid, another one we have that I didn't put in this presentation, Roundup. Roundup will make your rose grow so funny. You'll have multiple shoots, stems. It, just covered with little shoots and they're all dwarf. Leave the rose alone. In most cases, if it's not heavily sprayed with Roundup and it's just gotten a little bit of mist from it, it will survive. You're just gonna have to let it grow out of it. Remember, just continue watering it and fertilizing it just like you would all the time and cut out all of that bad foliage and stem, part of the stems, and it should send up correct stems next year, and your rose should recover from it. But yeah, we get a lot of questions on that too, on Roundup, on roses. I had our neighbor, when I lived in Columbia City, use Roundup in the East Wind. He deleted 53 roses of mine. Some of them never survived. We got too much on them, and it killed them. I was very unhappy with that neighbor for a while. In fact, I told him he wasn't allowed to use Roundup near our property again because of it. Um, so anyway, question.